Um, no, work as far as the story with Fort Riley, the, the 1918 flu started in Kansas. That's right. <laughs> you guys are to blame. What? <laughs> right. No, no, no influenza. No, no. Uh, influenza virus, uh, human flu, developed the way that it, it still can. It, the thing about flu is it, it, it evolves extraordinarily quickly. And most flu originates in birds, avian flu, uh, chickens. So they monitor that every year. And every year it's a little different. Uh, and just follow the news. You, you, you learn this. You know, the, the, the great, when they come up with a new strand of it, they immediately begin to develop a, 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 a what do you call it? Vaccination. That's not right. Um, so that's what they use chicken in? Yes. Um, anyway, um, it, it, but then they also, when, when a nasty one shows up, uh, you can you can get it from a chicken, uh, and you can die from it, as some people did this year. A really nasty strain this year, and, and, and uh, several people died in Asia from that. What's really dangerous is then when a person gets it from a chicken, and it evolves in that person into a form that that person can pass it on to another person. When that happens, then we're off and running. Yeah. That's what happened in 1918. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, um, for this second presentation, what I'd like to do is to move from that larger perspective of the Colombian Exchange <clears throat> and its impact and the place of Indian peoples uh, in indirectly their role in, in, in transforming the diet of the world in contributing to the uh, rise of human population, but paradoxically at the same time being themselves devastated 
collapsing in their population uh, because of this exchange, uh, because of this change, exchange from uh, the old world to the new. I'd like to move from that perspective to focus in on the impact of one particular organism, one particular part of the Columbian Exchange, one animal, uh, and to focus uh, more on the impact of this on Indian peoples, and specifically Indian peoples in this part of the country, um, and uh, specifically in the 19th century, the century that you all are, are, uh, are concentrating on uh, in, this, uh, in this grant. I call this the other American revolution, because I think this is, one, this is an example of how when we, uh, when we create these two alternate ways of thinking about American history, one, thinking about American history environmentally, that's the theme of the whole, um, your, your whole three days here. That's the theme that, that Mark started to talk about yesterday and that, uh, that Thomas will talk about uh, tomorrow and the next day. How American history looks different when we, when we introduce this conversation between the human and the non-human. That's one perspective. The other perspective is to reimagine, to literally review, revise, that's what revise means, revision, to review, revise American history through the vision of Indian peoples, to look at this familiar story through Indian eyes. It looks very different. It certainly looks very different if you go back far enough and look at the impact of diseases. But it looks very different uh, when you follow the story forward. And in fact, what we see, once we adopt that perspective, what we see then is a second American Revolution. <clears throat> it was going on about the same. It culminated. It goes back a long way. But this second American Revolution, this other American Revolution, culminated, came to its, um, its climax almost, as it turned out, simultaneously with the one that we normally think of. When I say to you the American Revolution, what you think of is people like this, leaders like this, and that. What you think of is uh, incidents, events like this. What you think of are documents like this. This other revolution going on focused not in the East, but in the West, this other revolution had leaders like this and that. It had events like this it had documents like that. It's a winter count. Anybody know what winter counts are? Have you all studied those before? Yeah. Wonderful things, yeah. This other revolution uh, was genuinely radical, in the way that I used the term earlier. This was a this is a revolution that, that revolu this is a revolution that radicalized, that radically changed the lives of the people in the American West. Fundamentally changed how they lived. It was genuinely revolutionary. <laughs> It had consequences that were political, like the other one. Consequences that were military, like the other one. Consequences that were economic, like the other one. It was as transformative and as important in the lives of these people as that American Revolution that we normally think of. But at its base, this revolution that was about that. <laughs> what is that? What do you see? What is it? No? Rolling planes, yeah. What do you see? <laughs> this is what it was all about. What it was all about really basically, literally radically to the roots was about grass. Grass. So another title for this talk uh, might have been, and I have used this one before, the grass revolution. 
this other revolution, we could also we could categorize as the grass revolution. So what are we talking about? To, uh, to understand this story, we've got to go back and, and remember a few basics. First, that <clears throat> um, what is today the United States, at the time of European contact, was home to hundreds of different Indian cultures, hundreds of different peoples. Today, there are federally recognized more than 500 tribes. Back then, there were even more of these groups. Most of them speaking uh, distinct, different, for the most part, um, mutually unintelligible languages. This was where we are living today and the nation that we live in today, that we, that we take pride uh, in, its, uh, in its diversity of peoples, its diversity of landforms. The diversity of cultures that we have today is nothing like what it was at the time that the first Europeans came. It's extraordinary range of peoples and ways of life and economies and cosmologies and so forth. But the other point to remember here is that for all of the variety, all of these people were bound together in this system of trade, system of exchange. And I gather from a few comments that, have, that I've heard, uh, heard here this morning is that you all are somewhat familiar with this, right? You've talked about this exchange, I think, some. Uh, maybe it was just from the, oh, the, the, the comment on the, the feathers and so forth, right? But uh, again, we, we tend to think, first of all, we tend to think of this ridiculous notion of, of Indians, so just, you know, Indians as the singular. Indians, one people, you know, which is preposterous. This great Indian comic once, that these people keep talking about you know, the, uh, the history of the American Indian. You know, the American Indian did this and that. It's just, who was this guy? <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, huge variety of peoples. But the other thing, we tend to, the, when, to the extent that we think of them as, as distinct and different, we think of them as being isolated from one another, and, and that is simply wrong. They were bound together by this remarkable system of trade. And coursing through the system of trade, these um, squares here are permanent trading settlements. The circles are major uh, trade rendezvous that come together annually or, or every few years to trade. The smaller one were trading entrepot. It was all linked together. And this is just the West. All of this was tied to the East as well, tied deep into Central America. That's where those bird feathers would come from. So all of the New, all of the new World, all of the Western Hemisphere, then was woven together by these, by these, uh, uh, by these um, systems of exchange and trade. And coursing through these systems were all kinds of materials, all kinds of things. <laughs> this is, I think, it's the same thing as over here on the table. What's this? Obsidian. Obsidian, uh, which is basically glass, volcanic glass. It can be napped uh, into extremely uh, sharp uh, edges. Uh, so this is ideal stuff for um, uh, for points. I have a friend who's a or a uh, eye surgeon, and he said that some eye surgeons use scalpels made out of obsidian because they're better than the finest steel scalpels that can be um, can be forged. They're sh actually sharper. <laughs> you you measure you, you measure the width of the blade in molecules. They're that sharp. Um, and it's also pretty, you know, pretty stuff. Well, obsidian, um, which is uh, the huge obsidian outcrop in, in Yellowstone National Park, there are obsidian sites um, elsewhere around the West, and this was traded all across, all across the country, all across the continent. Um, flint, this is the Ali Bates uh, Flint Quarry in uh, the Texas Panhandle, uh, not far from Amarillo. It is the, it is the, uh, the longest continuously used work site in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the flint that was found in the, um, uh, at Clovis, the famous Clovis find uh, back in the early 20th century, uh, that flint had been, had been quarried at uh, Ali Bates. Um, and it was operated, it was, it was, it was quarried until the uh, 1870s and 1880s by Arapahoes. So for 12,000 years, this was a work site. Uh, turquoise from the southwest. Mica from the Appalachians. I was given these uh, shards. 
uh, from um, around here. No, Mississippi Valley, you said Mississippi Valley, and they have, they're kind of... Lens. We stole them from in the U. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they're uh, kind of sparkly, uh, which is probably mica, and if it's mica in the Mississippi Valley, it's probably from the southern, southern Appalachians. So these are called prestige points or trade points. Bird feathers, we talked about those. Conch shells uh, from, the, uh, from the Gulf Coast. Mussel shells from uh, the Gulf of California and the Southern Pacific Coast. All of this stuff is moving around, and, and of course, much more than that. What we what we have here uh, is the kind of evidence we have here are the things that survive over time. Uh, there must have been all sorts of other things being traded around, uh, you know, that, that did not survive time. Uh, things that are organic and therefore um, more susceptible to that. And with that, of course, <laughs> what else? Ideas, right? um, religions, ways of thinking about God, of a uh, uh, artistic patterns, traditions, stories, languages. So there was this sort of continuous mixing together of things and cultures and peoples going on for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. <clears throat> patterns like this. Well, what happens then when Europeans show up is that Europeans, European goods, things that Europeans brought that the Indians wanted in exchange for things that the Europeans wanted from the Indians, those European goods immediately plug into this system and begin to move through it. This is a map that shows trade patterns that developed after contact. Mostly, of course, because of the fur trade. So in exchange for the furs, along with sugar, one of these very desirable items in the global economy, Europeans offered all kinds of products, all sorts of things, that the, Europe, that the Indians uh, wanted very badly. And so that, those things were added to all of those goods that were moving around um, in that system. So what you see here, this is pre-contact, post-contact, and you notice that the patterns are basically the same. So here's, here's what's going on before Columbus and the trade. What we think of is you know, the fur trade, what we think of is this innovation, this new development, really is just an extension of this older one. And it flourished because the Europeans, in fact, brought with them all kinds of goods that helped revolutionize Indian life. We think of, because, because of course we're, we are uh, most aware of the ultimate catastrophic effect on Indian peoples and cultures, including the effect of disease, you know, uh, because that is, because we, we know of course that that's the bottom line. The big story is awful. But because that stays so much in, the, in front of our face, we tend to overlook the fact that in so many ways, especially at first contact, the Indians' response to the coming of Europeans is, this is great. <laughs> this is great. Now, these people have all kinds of stuff that we don't have. One fundamental way in which European technology and society was different from Indian technology is that Europeans were far ahead of Indian peoples in metallurgy. Indians had some metalwork, copper, but nothing like the metalwork, the metal technology that Europeans had. So think, think of what that suddenly offered to these people. And that was just part of it. So many things, so many things that Europeans had were very, very impressive. Very impressive. The earliest accounts, and it's very hard, of course, to go back and get some sense because there was no written record. Um, get some sense of what Europeans, of what Indians thought when they first came into contact. You know, but most of the evidence we have is uh, these are very odd people. In some ways, they're kind of repulsive. But boy, 
they really got some cool stuff. You know, <laughs> they got some really neat stuff. And I sure would like to get some of it. So they did. <clears throat> and it went through this trading system. <clears throat> and we have a sense of what was there. You can get a sense of what was there through archaeology. Uh, there have been archaeological digs, and some of those, if you go back here, uh, you know, some of these places where a lot of trade went on, there have been digs at some of those places. One of them, high up on the Missouri River in what's today North Dakota, in those villages where Lewis and Clark stayed in their first winter of 1804 to 1805, right there, at the villages of the Mandan and Adatsa people. People who later were nearly wiped out by smallpox in the 1830s. But at this time, this was a major center of population. And it was a major trading center, trading sort of exchange between regions. There have been uh, archaeological digs there. What did they find? You know, once they got down in there and, and, and pulled out the stuff, what stuff did they find? This is a George Kaplan's depiction of, that, uh, of one of those villages. Here are some things. Uh, these are called gorgets. Uh, they are worn around the, uh, like an ornament, or in the throat. Copper bells, bracelets. What's this? Hair. A what? Is it for hair? No. It's kind of like a needle. Got a big for what? An awl. An awl, thank you. That is A-W-L. I grew up in Texas. Uh, therefore, I, I cannot pr correctly pronounce the word awl. <laughs> awl. See, in, in Texas, awl is, is that black stuff that comes out of the ground that makes money for you. Awl. It's an awl whale. <laughs> an awl. An awl is uh, what you use to drill a hole in a skin. So, <laughs> If you're going to sew skins together, for example, uh, you need an awl to, to drill a hole in it. If you're going to uh, put beadwork on it, you've got to, you've got to have that. Well, before, before this, awls were made out of bone. You can imagine how long it took you know, to, to, uh, to, to uh, carve a piece of bone down to as fine a point as you would need to do that, and how often it would then break. So this thing. You know, it was a miracle. <laughs> if you're an Indian woman you know, who, who are expected to do that kind of labor, that kind of difficult, time-consuming labor, you know, uh, that is, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of you know, washing machines and refrigerators tied together. A metal pot. Before, pots were ceramic or they were made out of woven plant fibers. Ceramic pots broke easily. Plant fibers, they couldn't be put over a fire, obviously, so you had to, to heat water, and you filled them with water, and then you heated stones and put the stones in the water until it finally got hot enough to make a, make a soup. A metal pot, an iron pot, was a miracle for those people, people like that. Uh, and the same was true for you know, so much of this stuff. Uh, so these were miracle goods, miracle goods. Uh, and they immediately began to try to, to try to get them. And those goods then began to transform their lives, giving them, um, in so many ways, a higher standard of living, an easier way of life, a better way of life. So, despite the ultimate outcome of contact between European and Indian peoples, uh, at the outset, at the outset, until they started dying, of course. <laughs> At the outset, the result of European contact was good. It was cultivated, sought by Indians. <clears throat> so all kinds of goods, but two sorts of goods above all were desired, more than others. Number one, what you see here, implied here, what are those? Flintlocks. Firearms. Weaponry. 
So we have metal points, fish hooks. Again, those have been made out of bone before. A metal fish hook. Think up, think up what that was worth. But here, firearms, firearms, uh, eagerly sought, partly simply for prestige reasons. Uh, they were considered at first kind of magical, if you can imagine. You know, the first time, never, if you never even thought of the of the of the existence of a shotgun, you know, first time you see and hear a shotgun go off, you know, woo, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Uh, but eventually, of course, uh, useful for other things, hunting and for warfare. Now, uh, firearms were probably, uh, were, in fact, more desirable in parts of the West than in the East because of terrain. Firearms are far more effective in hunting and in warfare in open areas, like around here. Uh, you can kill at a far greater distance. What you see in the history of European Indian contact in the Great Plains and the Far West in general is this, this uh, uh, enormous demand for firearms, which can tip the military ballots pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. Uh, firearms came into the West mostly from the East and from the North. They came in from Canada and from the Eastern part of the United States. Firearms were, uh, therefore, uh, far more common the farther east you got. Where we're talking about here in the Missouri Valley, that was about as far, far as far west as firearms extended uh, about the time of Lewis and Clark, at the time the United States acquired that country. So consequently, there was a great, there was a great demand for firearms west of there in the farther west and in the southwest, and a great supply of it in the northeast, right? So hold on to that. The second item that was so uh, ardently desired by Indians <clears throat> was, in uh, this case, not metal, but animal, horses. Horses. Uh, now here, um, as I mentioned in the article here, uh, there is a certain um, there is a certain irony, because in one sense, horses were being introduced into the West, but in another sense, horses were coming home. They were returning, returning to the West. <coughs> along with all of those other sorts of animals, some of which um, had also evolved here before going extinct. So um, the horse then, when it returns to where you are right now, and this is one of the very, you are very, very close to where Indian peoples, modern Indian peoples, first saw plains peoples, first saw horses, very, very close to where horses uh, made this dramatic return uh, to the new world. Uh, but as I said, they were coming home. The story of the horse, in fact, goes back 50 million years, roughly. This was the proto-horse. This was the, it was the first called Eohippus, which means dawn horse, the horse of the dawn. Hierarchitherium appeared probably first around the Great Lakes, but then moved over to the Great Plains about 50 million years ago, it's about the size of a, of a collie. And there, Hierarchitherium uh, evolved through this typical evolutionary bush. All of these are dead ends. These are you know, descendants of Hierarchitherium that died out. But enough of them survived But they evolved eventually into the modern uh, genus, uh, Equus. And there were different kinds of Equus. There were probably several kinds of Equus uh, in, on the Great Plains up until about uh, 10,000, 10,000 years ago. <clears throat> so 
So um, by about, uh, it, it goes back probably, it, it's, it's, there's different, different numbers here, but certainly by about 150,000 years ago, there was this horse that we would recognize as a horse living on the Great Plains and spreading outward from there into different parts of what's today the United States. But the horse, Equus, as well as um, so many of these other animals, uh, was also in movement, in migration. And at the time of the last ice age, what's called the Wisconsin glaciation of the late Pleistocene era, um, as the glaciers uh, grew, the ocean levels declined. You know, basically, there's a finite amount of water on Earth. And when more and more of that water is trapped on Earth as ice, then less and less of it returns to the sea, and the sea levels drop. Consequently, today we have just the opposite happening as the, uh, as the uh, glaciers uh, melt, as they decline, then the ocean levels rise, and that's a matter of, a matter of some concern. Uh, so what we, what we would see if we were able to go back about 18,000 years ago, uh, what we would see is uh, if you would go to the Pacific Coast, <laughs> the Pacific Coast would be about another 100 miles out in the Pacific from where it is now. Uh, you know, uh, San Francisco would be inland, about 100 miles. Uh, the same thing was true on the, on the Atlantic side. Uh, and furthermore, if you were to go up farther north to what's Alaska, you would find Alaska uh, uh, bridged to Siberia with a great land mass. It's called Beringia. We call it Beringia, the Bering Straits. Beringia, a country, a land mass that was there then is not there now, and this land mass <clears throat> allowed a movement of all sorts of living things back and forth between what's today Alaska and is today Siberia and Central Asia. All kinds of animals went back and forth. Uh, obviously, camels did. Camels that evolved here on the Great Plains made their way over to Asia. Um, horses did. <clears throat> all sorts of other animals did as well. There were also animals, of course, that made it in the other direction. This was another Columbian exchange. <laughs> it's another case of, of species moving back and forth between the two hemispheres. One of them that went from the old world to the new world via Beringia was the bison. Bison evolved in the old world. Bison evolved in Europe and in uh, Western Asia. There are descendants of the bison there now. And the bison migrated across Beringia uh, into the New World and where they proliferated. Uh, there were different types of them. Up until about 10,000 years ago, there was what's called the bison latifrons or the uh, <coughs> bison antiquus. This bison was um, uh, far larger than the bison today. Bison today is the largest land animal in the Western Hemisphere. Bison antiquus was about uh, twice as large. Um, anybody watch the um, NBA Finals last night? <laughs> you could take LeBron James. LeBron James could stretch out between the tips of the horns of bison latifrons, and his uh, head and his feet would not touch uh, either tip. That's a big animal. <laughs> right. <clears throat> And there was also bison, bison americanus, the one that we, the one we see here today. So this sort of exchange of animals back and forth across Beringia, and included in that, of course, were people. People. That was how. I mean, the one. There's speculation about other routes, but that one we know for sure. The people migrated from Asia into the Americas via Beringia. <clears throat> I think we're all familiar with this idea. Um, I know I you know, grew up hearing in the school, and I had this, had this notion of Beringia being the sort of this narrow strip of land, almost like rocks across a creek, you know, where people sort of go, yeah, like, <laughs> get from one hemisphere to another, sort of balancing their way over. No, Beringia was hundreds of miles wide. It was uh, on its uh, southern shore. It was, um, uh, was the Japanese current, the current that came up from uh, uh, the Asian tropics very warm water. Um, 
Consequently, the, the uh, climate of Beringia was quite uh, moderate. It was covered with grasslands and with thick conifers. So this was, this was you know, a very desirable country. And it was full of animals, part of them you know, going both ways. <clears throat> and it was hunting of those animals that brought people into it and brought them eventually over to the other side. So this was this you know, very busy corridor of contact. And across that corridor, um, Equus moved into Asia, and there, and there began to uh, pr uh, pr grow in numbers and to evolve. Evolved into zebras, evolved into asses, evolved into all the sort of the equine forms that, today that you find uh, in the old world. As a Dan Forrest, uh, who's written on this at the University of Montana, uh, Dan says, uh, every form of old world horse uh, was basically an American tourist uh, who forgot to go home. <laughs> then, uh, about 10,000 years ago, as you know, uh, the climate began to change. <clears throat> and we saw the, the end of the Wisconsin glaciation. The Ice Age came to an end. Uh, the weather got warmer. Um, the great ice packs began to melt, eventually largely disappeared, except for surviving glaciers. And as that happened, of course, the water continued its cycle. It returned uh, to the sea. And as it did then, the oceans began to fill up more. Uh, Pacific coastline inched inland to San Francisco and LA, uh, and Beringia was covered. The bridge was washed out. And with that, the contact stopped. That was that I began by talking about this morning. That was when these two worlds, when these, this one world essentially became two worlds, separated in human in terms of human and animal contact. And as part of that, as part of that great climate change, a lot of animals, especially in the New World, became extinct. And among those were the horses. So did the camels, of course. There were dozens of species. There was an American lion. There was, of course, the famous saber-toothed uh, uh, cats. Um, there were giant sloths. There were armadillos uh, about the size of modern-day Volkswagen beetles with long tails with spiked balls on the end. <laughs> the terrifying armadillo. <laughs> uh, uh, all, of these, all of these critters uh, uh, went extinct. How that happened is still a matter of great debate. Certainly, climate change was a very, very important part of it. There is also the argument today that um, one of the reasons that so many animals became extinct in the new world and not in the old world, that's a puzzle. You know, if the climate's changing everywhere. So if climate change is the only answer, the only reason, then why did horses go extinct in America but not in Asia? Well, one speculation is, one answer is people that the newly arrived hunters, their numbers are going very rapidly because they had left diseases behind. Uh, the, Indian, the animals were not, uh, were not uh, adapted to human hunting, and that human beings sort of pushed them over the edge, human hunting, over hunting. This is called the Blitzkrieg thesis, <laughs> like, the, like the, you know, the Nazi uh, lightning war. The people came in like a Blitzkrieg and wiped out, helped wipe out these animals. Um, uh, I should emphasize that that is uh, there's a lot of argument about that. I used to believe it. I used to go along with it uh, much more than I do today. There's, there's just certain problems with it. Uh, how in the world would they have killed that many horses? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, lions. You don't hunt lions for food. Lions hunt you for food. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but what, whatever the reason, it's a fascinating argument. Whatever the answer is, uh, it happened. All of these animals, poof, they vanished. So about 10,000 years ago, Equus uh, disappears from here, survives over there. 
And then at some point, it's about 5,000 years ago, probably in what is today the Ukraine, one of the most important developments in human history occurred. People began to domesticate the horse. Roughly about that period of time, or the span of several thousand years, that began to domesticate cattle and other animals. But it was in the Ukraine, probably, but the first time they began to do that to horses. The wild horses became domesticated horses. Equus became what's called Equus cabayas. Probably at first for food, for milk, horse milk, very nutritious. Um, then probably for as a beast of burden. But at some point, somebody got on the back of a horse and began to ride around on it <laughs> and said, whoa, <laughs> this, is, this is important. <laughs> you know, this is important. You know, the back of a goat, <laughs> <laughs> back of a horse, whoa. <laughs> uh, yes? I was just going to ask, how do you Boy, you got me. I, I personally haven't tried, but. Uh, <laughs> I know the first one is to make sure a woman. Exactly right. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's like you did a cow. They're, they're ugly. They're little bit smaller. You have to kind of use the finger and the thumb to squeeze it down. There you have. Holy cow. Yeah. Is anybody going to sell horse milk anymore? Can't say horse meat, certainly. Well, but not Google that. Google that. Google that. <laughs> Check your local uh, organic food store and yeah, see what you <laughs> Say, where's your horse milk? <laughs> <laughs> the dairy case, the dairy case over here, right? Uh, right. So anyway, um, this, looking back on it, you know, this was one of the most, this, this would impact human history from that point, whatever it was, 5,000 years ago, until really the late 19th century. When, when, in the 19th century, the century that you're focusing on, is also the, the, the century which sees basically the end of what we call horse cultures, that is, societies that revolve around the horse. Because in the 19th century, we develop options through technology for what the horse could do. What could the horse do? What was discovered was that once you're on horseback, you, know, or you have, you know, in addition to what the other things you can do with the horse, look at how suddenly your life is expanded. You know, with a horse, you, know, you can uh, obviously travel farther. You can pull big things. You can hunt more efficiently. Uh, you can trade farther for more things. And you can fight better far more effective military force. force for in military terms, horses were first used um, as a variation of pulling things, chariots. <clears throat> the first uses of horses in, in warfare, and for the first uh, many, many, many uh, uh, hundreds of years, was through chariots. If you look, you know, ancient history, Ben-Hur, all that stuff. Uh, it's chariot use. At some point, you know, they figured out, uh, very, very famous article written many years ago now about the impact of human culture of the stirrup. The stirrup. Because with the stirrup, uh, you not only can sit on the back of a horse, you can seat yourself on the back of a horse and stay on it. And with that, the horseback warrior becomes possible. You don't have to have them, but they sure help, especially on larger horses. So consequently, uh, these horse peoples became far more affluent, richer, and far more aggressive. And just about every well-developed horse people, horse culture, eventually becomes um, a conquering people, becomes expansionist, because they can. <clears throat> and they conquer others with the horse. But then, of course, the people who are conquered eventually adopt the horse themselves. And they become expansionist. They are better off. <clears throat> so the horse culture then sort of moves across the world into, into whatever those places where large numbers of horses can be cultivated. And they can't, 
can be uh, can live. That's not everywhere. There's certain parts of the world where horses don't work. But wherever they do, um, people become horse culture. So let's look at that term uh, for a moment. A horse culture, a culture in this sense means a, um, a collection of people who are distinct <laughs> from other peoples because of certain ways of life. And the horse culture, a horse culture is a people who for whom the horse becomes a central element of their way of life. Put it another way, sort of turn it around. They they won't be they couldn't be who they are without horses. You know? We are, let's let's face it, a car culture. This never ceases to astonish me when I think of that. I flew here yesterday, you know, when you, uh, you're you flying over a city, you look down, look at all the damn cars. <laughs> God, you know, and each one is worth thousands of dollars, right? What is, the, what is the total value of what you're looking at? You know, obviously, when a society is paying that much money, you know, it's something they have to have. How many people do you know who... who don't have or have access to a car. I had lunch with a, a good friend of mine. She's, a, uh, she's about to defend her dissertation to graduate from the University of Chicago uh, with, with a PhD. Um, well, she's going to have to buy a car. <laughs> she's, she has a job now in the real world. You know, she's got to have a car. Uh, we're a car culture. We're rapidly becoming a cyber culture. And those of us who can't deal with it um, might as well die, basically. <laughs> Uh, uh, we are, you might say, we're a blue jean culture, right? <laughs> right? What's the thing about selling a, 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 a swapping a, a pair of blue jeans for a car in, in Poland, you said? Yeah, well, you know, because, you know, I mean, think of it. You know, uh, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of a defining element of a way of life. Uh, so a horse culture is a culture, is a, is a group of people who are defined by their use of the horse. It, it pervades their life. And the reason it does is because it can do so much for them. So much for them. Now, so, uh, horses evolve here, migrate to Asia, die out here, meanwhile continue in Asia, uh, evolve into other forms, multiply in numbers, and eventually are domesticated in Western Asia, in the Ukraine. And then they begin to expand uh, into Southern Asia and Southeast Asia, into China, which of course, so horses are uh, crucial to uh, Chinese culture, into uh, the Mideast, where some of the great horse cultures and, and horse militaristic people evolve. Uh, Northern Africa, the great Moorish tradition, and then also directly westward into Europe and less directly out of North Africa into Europe. Horse cultures moving around the world, eventually into Europe. And nowhere in Europe was the horse culture more fully evolved and developed than in Iberia, in the Spanish Peninsula. Because it was in Iberia that you have these two horse cultures coming together. There's the one that evolves in Europe, and then with the Muslim conquest, the horse culture that comes out of North Africa. The Islamic culture and the, uh, you know, the um, North African Islamic culture, the European Christian cultures come together in, in Iberia, one of the fascinating stories of, of, of um, you know, the last couple of uh, uh, 1,200 years. This mingling of traditions. Have you ever been to Iberia, uh, to Spain? You know, you see that. You see, you know, this North African and, and European cultures mingling together. Uh, well, part of that was horses. And the Spanish became some of the great horse people of the modern world, including the use of horses in the military. So then, it's the, then the Spanish then who make the jump over into the New World, and when they jump. They come with horses and with this tradition. 
and it's a very important part of their ability to conquer. The other things going for them, disease, uh, divisions among, among native peoples, you know, conflicts between the Aztecs and outlying peoples, uh, metalwork, um, other things. But very important to this was horses, the military impact of horses. So the Spanish then uh, take control of the Indies. They move westward into Mexico, conquer the Aztecs, control central Mexico. They begin to move northward into northern Mexico, looking for other great areas. And as part of that, of course, they send this very famous uh, conquistador, uh, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. Coronado came up uh, through northern Mexico into Arizona and into Mexico, uh, made contact with Indian peoples there, and they told him of what he thought he heard or thought the translations sounded like, great cities of wealth uh, to the east and to the north, and then he went off into the Great Plains uh, in search of these so-called uh, cities of gold, cities of Cibola, uh, into what is today Kansas. We think, we're pretty sure today that uh, he made his first, uh, his farthest north reach uh, was quite near here, near Wichita, perhaps a little bit, a little bit downstream. Uh, that's about as far north, we think, as, uh, as Columbus went. Um, he found not gold, but pumpkins, uh, and um, strangled the uh, guide who, uh, who took him there, uh, the Turk. Uh, turned around and turned around and went back. But at that point, what had happened? It was at that point when when Coronado reached the Arkansas River, right in your neighborhood, that you could say, you, know, you live, you live, basically in the neighborhood where this uh, where this ten thousand year circumnavigation of the globe uh, ended. It was right here that the horse had gone entirely around the world and returned to its birthplace. Interesting place to live. <laughs> but it came back, and here is the crucial point. It came back essentially as a different animal. It was biologically essentially the same. It was still equus. But it was fundamentally different in that it had, it had formed a partnership with human beings. It was now a social animal. It was now a domesticated animal. And in fact, what I would ask you to do is to think of all of this as one animal. Think of this as a single creature, fused together, two species fused into one. What's the Spanish word for gentleman? That's just, that's just man or, or sir. See it in, in Mexican restaurants that are trying to be fancy, they'll put it on the men's room door. <laughs> Caballero. 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 <laughs> Means literally horseman. Because the, the gentlemen of the European feudal tradition were the men with horses. So a horse man was a gentleman, a caballero, horser, or horse man. Um, well, think of this as caballero, it is a, literally a horse man. Think of it as a centaur, right? Horse body, human upper body. What is a horse man? A horse man, one animal, a horse man is an animal with the strength and the power and the speed and the grace of a horse and the brain and the imagination and the arrogance and the dreams of a human being fused into one thing. That's what, that's what came here. And in that sense, this was a new introduction. The horse had come home, but it had come home in a sense 
in practical terms as a new species, a caballero, a horse man, and that made all the difference. Consequently, horses, once they were set loose, <laughs> began to spread across the West and across the nation. It was, um, this was, this was the beginnings of the other American Revolution. Sketch by George Kaplan. It captures, you know, it, it captures something else here that says, you can look at this mechanistically, you can look at it um, in terms of what specifically the horses did, in terms of allowing people to do things, but it really misses a point. I, I'm not, uh, I haven't been on a horse in more than 50 years, I don't think. My granddaughter loves horses. You know, and I know people who are really horse people. And there's, I do remember as a boy being on a horse, one of the few times I was on a horse that ran. You know, there is no feeling like that. It's this feeling of somehow transcending the rest of humanity, you know. You are flying. You know? <laughs> it's this sense of empowerment, of, of magic, that is really seductive. That's what you, I see it in sketches like this. That, is, as much of the appeal as the ability to hunt and, and to kill, I think. And they really proliferated. Horses do best on temperate grasslands. These are the two, by far, the two largest temperate grasslands on earth. This is where uh, they came over through here, moved down to here. This is where they proliferated. This is where the horse cultures began. Here's where, of course, the, you know, the Tartars, the uh, Mongols, great expansionist warrior horseback peoples. Then they moved down into China, over into Europe, down through here, came together here, then over here, to there, and then up here, to this other great pasture. And they, once they began to spread, they spread very, very rapidly. Now they first appeared, reappeared, in the West in the 1540s with Coronado, but they spread much later. They were concentrated down here uh, where the, in the Spanish New Mexico, along the Rio Grande Valley. And they were critical for the Spanish conquest and for the Spanish um, administration, for the, for the Spanish settlement there. But the Spanish understood, of course, that the last thing in the world that they could afford was, was to let Indians get horses. You know, that's suicide. <laughs> suicide. Uh, and so they were very careful to keep them entirely to themselves. Now, they couldn't entirely do it, of course. The Navajos got some, the Apaches got some, the Comanches got some, but not in very many numbers. So horses then were concentrated down here from the Spanish settlement, Spanish settlement, which was um, in the late 16th century, up until uh, 1680. Very hundred years then. In 1680s, you may know, uh, a, an extraordinary thing happened in the Southwest. For the first time, the only time, the only time in all of European colonial history uh, in what's today the United States, Indians successfully drove out the Europeans. It's the only successful Indian uprising in American history. And the Pueblo peoples in the upper Rio Grande Valley rose up. Uh, and drove the Spanish out, the so-called Pope insurrection, drove them southward to what's today El Paso, Texas. For 12 years, then, the Indians uh, had that place to themselves. The Spanish were gone. And it was that point, at that point, 1680 then, that the horses were suddenly set, let loose into the rest of the West. And look how rapidly they go. Each of these dates is when the horse culture is established. 20 years later, up here with the Shoshones. 20 years after that, among the Pawnees. 10 more years, the Nez Perce, way up here in the, this is, you know, Lewis and Clark got up into the Pacific Northwest, they got horses from the Shoshones and the Nez Perces that had Spanish brands on them, that have been traded from the Southwest, all the way up there. Uh, 10 years later, the Blackfeet on the Plains, the Cree up here in Canada, 
very, very rapid once it starts. And by 1780, keep that date in mind, by 1780, horse cultures have spread across the West as far as they will go. 100 years. In one short century, this way of life in the West was transformed. By the coming, by the coming home of the horse and the arrival of the horse man. And with that came this burst of affluence, this new way of life. And burst of power, and shuffling of power, and great diplomatic changes, expansion of trade, new ways of life, warfare, the same kinds of changes that, we've been, that could have been seen across the world over the past uh, several thousand years. What's fascinating here to me, a point often forgotten, is that this rise of the horse culture, this transformation of life, two things. It, it happens where the horses were born, and it's the last one. This is the last place this story happened on Earth, where you live. It goes from Ukraine to Kansas. Well, it's a, um, as I said, it's a, it's a genuinely revolutionary change and movement, um, and it has to do with all kinds of things. It expands power in so many different ways, but basically, as I said at the outset, this, this revolution, this other American revolution, gets down to, literally down to grass. Grass. Because it is the fact that this is a grassland that allows this to happen as, as dramatically as it did. One of the two great grasslands on Earth. And this in turn has to do with the question of the relationship between energy and power. Energy and power. Power is when organisms, including people, tap into energy and use it. Power is the, is the exercise of energy. It all starts with energy. Everything we do requires energy. And the energy has to come from somewhere. And all energy, I can't say that anymore, I just read about an article yesterday, I think, or the day before, in Discover Magazine, <laughs> speculating on sources of energy other than the sun, but in, in real terms, in practical terms, all energy is solar energy. It begins as solar energy. It's this unimaginable uh, gift from the sun that's pouring down on us right now, especially right now in Kansas this time of year. <laughs> you, really, you really get the point, right? When you walk out there at 2 o'clock, right? Whoa, there's a lot of energy coming down here. Um, solar energy pouring down, and that solar energy then um, we only get, of course, a tiny, 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 infinitesimally small fraction of what's being sent out by the sun. But enough of it lands here uh, to sustain life. All life. All life goes back to the sun. Everything is somehow transformed sunlight. But obviously we can't directly you access that energy. It has to go through different forms. So this has to do with what um, biologists call the energy pyramid. You might remember this from your biology biology courses. Um, the so the, uh, the sun is pouring down all of this energy, but most of that energy is, is lost. Some of it, estimated about 10% of it, is taken in by the only life forms that can directly access the sun. That's plants. Through photosynthesis, plants can take sunlight the energy from sunlight and use it to, to make themselves, create themselves, to create other plants, to feed themselves, uh, to do what plants do. Right? So, if X is the energy of the sun, 
the energy acquired by grass from the sun is about 10% uh, of x, one-tenth x, right? All right. Um, now, some animals, including us, can then acquire the solar energy from plants, eat them, thus corn, <laughs> potatoes, wheat, rice, the rest. Uh, the problem there is that um, most of the energy is being used by the plants for its own uses. So when you eat the plant, you only get what's left over, and that's about 10%. So when you eat plants, you're getting about 10% of the energy acquired by the, by the plants. Right? Or about 1%. Now, there are some animals that can only eat plants. Bison, they're called herbivores. So the sun comes down, the energy goes into plants, 90% is lost. Herbivores eat the plants, 90% is lost. Now some animals, now we are called omnivores, we can eat both plants and meat. Uh, but some animals, of course, can only eat meat, carnivores. So they have to wait until the energy goes from the sun to plants to herbivores, then they eat the herbivores, they get the energy. But most of the energy that the herbivore gets, like a bison, is used in being bison. So all they get is what's left over, about 10%. <clears throat> so by the time people of the plains killed bison and eat them to get the sunlight, uh, they were down to about one one thousandth of the original energy. 0.01%. So there's this, <laughs> and then of course, if you want to take it one step farther, <laughs> Poor grizzlies, you know, they only get one ten thousandth of the uh, of the solar energy. So, so this is a, you know, it's kind of an ironic thing. <clears throat> we, we're familiar with the, with the uh, we're familiar with the food chain. Those animals that are at the top of the food chain, people and grizzlies, are at the bottom of the energy chain. <laughs> Thus, there's far more grass than bison, far more bison than wolves more bison than people, far more people than grizzlies. Right. <laughs> so, once you understand that, what happens when equus becomes caballero? What happens in human historical terms when those two species fuse into one animal? Basically, what happens is what I call the big energy jump. <clears throat> if X is the energy of the sun, before horses, Indians on the plain who were eating bison that eat grass got about 0.1% of the solar of the energy available. Once you have caballero, once you have the centaur. <laughs> Once you have the horse man, <clears throat> you jump 10 times. In terms of the practical historical effect, when people get on a horse, when a man gets on a horse, he, he has access to 10 times as much energy as he had before. Because now, in effect, he can directly access the grass all the power that he needs is under him, is part of him. And that power now is grass powered. Suddenly, <clears throat> you know, people become grass eaters, right? When you're on a horse, in terms of practical power, you're now a grass eating animal. But you've got a human brain, and human ambition, and human arrogance. What happens is people's relationship to the world fundamentally changes because this changes. This is the fundamental environment in terms of environmental history. This is the basis of the horse revolution.
This is the basis of what had happened over 5,000 years from Ukraine to the American Great Plains. This, this fundamental shift in the environmental relationship between human beings and the world around them. That conversation had suddenly taken a huge jump. And the results were you know, almost incalculable, as they had been wherever this had happened. That's what transforms history during those, uh, during, as a result of those, uh, the horse revolution, the big energy jump. So what happens here? This is a, 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 a drawing based upon descriptions of Indians that Coronado found in, the, in this area when he was here in the 1540s. These were people he called Carechos. Uh, it looks kind of familiar to us. They're what appear to be teepees, but you know, if this woman were to stand up, they're like pup tents. There are very few of them. Uh, there's some, a dog with a travois. There's some bison meat drying in the sun. There's a bison head. This sort of tells you what this way of life was like. But with horses, it's that. Now they're sort of, you know, from that to that, like McMansions. Much larger dwellings, much more of them, much more people riding out to hunt bison, tanning the hides. What's inside those things? Look at the size of those teepees of Blackfeet, Northern Plains. Inside them, all of these trade goods, carpets from New England, <laughs> coffee uh, from um, Africa, coffee grinders from New England, knives from Sheffield in England, beads from, uh, from Italy, <coughs> all kinds of things that they can now afford, <coughs> they can now get. The, um, the great Kiowa leader, Satanta, uh, Satanta, a great warrior, uh, the story about, uh, there's a description of, of, of Satanta when he would have guests to his lodge, to his teepee. He had a, a carpet on the floor, he had this, these beautiful tables inside, <coughs> and he would, my throat's getting dry here, excuse me. Thank you. When it came time for dinner, he would step outside and summon his guests by blowing on a French horn. <laughs> this, you know, this, this transformed way of life. Now, one result of this is that suddenly the grassland, <coughs> grasslands that had not been, <coughs> not been especially desirable before, suddenly became very desirable. This becomes a very desirable real estate. Virtually every Indian group that we think of as being Plains Indians were recent migrants. Came only in the past 150 years before uh, Lewis and Clark. The Comanches, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, Crows, uh, the Assiniboines, the Crees. <clears throat> All of these people moved onto the Plains only after the coming of the horse because suddenly the plains was the place to be. So the population, Indian population of the plains, uh, rises rapidly, dramatically. And with that conflict, this becomes one of the bloodiest, most con <coughs> contested areas in the country. <coughs> because of that. So, notice here, when this happens, how fast it happens, not just how fast it happens, but when it happens. Uh, I suggested to you, I mentioned to you a date, and I ask you to keep it in your head, when we can say that the horse revolution is basically in place, the horse cultures are basically in place, this revolution is basically completed in the West. Do you remember what date that was? 1780. Now, if I were to ask you, if I were to say to you, something really important was going on in the United States in the 1750s and 60s and 70s, and it sort of culminates, it sort of comes together in the 1770s, you know, and it kind of, a, you could say that it's really, you know, pretty much 
but it really comes to its climax uh, around 1780, 83, <laughs> right? What would you say? You know, the American Revolution. But the interesting thing here is these two revolutions are simultaneous. They both come to the American Revolution, of course, its roots go way back, and both of them sort of culminate at exactly the same moment. So at the same time, you know, that, uh, that uh, uh, Lexington and Concord and, and Valley Forge and, and, uh, and uh, Saratoga and Yorktown you know, and the Peace of Paris are happening in the East. Uh, this is happening in the West. Both of them, I would argue to you, equally consequential for those people. Both of them revolutionary, both of them transformative. But this is an American Revolution seen through Indian eyes. <clears throat> what makes it a tragic story is that we know, of course, now, looking back on it, once you recognize these twin revolutions, once you see that, you recognize, of course, that within just about another 100 years, by 1880, this revolution, the one on the Atlantic coast, would crush that one. And this great flower of life and power in the West <clears throat> would be that fast, that short. And this other one, this other American Revolution, this one American Revolution then would suffocate the other one, crush it. 1876, right? Little Bighorn, the Great Sioux War, 77, the Nez Perce War. It's the end of the American Wars and basically the end of the course culture. But it's, it has another aspect to it that I want to end with, just got a few minutes, um, that also ties into the first topic this morning <clears throat> that was part of this collapse, part of this uh, tragic story where these two things are, are woven together. Remember this. Uh, smallpox, very ill a major. Smallpox was a very important part, of course, in the conquest of Indian peoples in the New World generally, but what's interesting here is that smallpox did not arrive in the West until much later than it did elsewhere. While smallpox was devastating people and wiping out millions of Indians elsewhere, Indian Western people, Indians, were exempt. <laughs> Why was that? There's our, yuck, okay. Um, the reason was isolation, practical isolation. Smallpox is a virus. A virus uh, can only, typically, typically, can only be communicated during a very brief window of time. In the case of smallpox, it's about 10 days to two weeks. A person who gets smallpox can pass it along only during that, or during that period. By the end of that period, that person has either killed the virus through uh, resistance, or the person's dead. Uh, so it's got to happen within this brief time. Now, smallpox had hit the Southwest several times, and Texas several times, but, th but it stopped. It didn't go any farther into the interior. So the Indians of the, of the Far West then were spared it uh, uh, until, <laughs> until when? This is a, a winter count, of course. Each of these is an emblem of a, the most important thing that happened in a particular year. This is a Sioux, Lakota winter count. Smallpox used them up winter. Uh, this, this means terrible pain, lesions, sores. Uh, this most, the, worst, the most important thing that happened in that particular year was uh, smallpox hit. It devastated uh, the tribes uh, of the upper Missouri. It devastated um, uh, tribes, uh, uh, tribes in the Pacific Northwest. It also hit tribes in the interior, a bit less so. It's one of the reasons that the Sioux were able to rise to power is they were hit relatively less than other tribes. But it sweeps across the American West, especially up the Missouri River into the Pacific Northwest. Look at the year. 1780. In fact, we know now from an excellent book came out several years ago called Pax Americana, 
uh, the, the role that smallpox played in the American Revolution and the, the other re revolution. And the writer of that, uh, Elizabeth Finn, also shows how then it, sp it spread uh, to, uh, to Mexico uh, and eventually to the far west. Why then? Why was it that the west was able to keep, uh, keep free of smallpox all of those years for generations and generations and then suddenly gets hit in 1780? Why? Horses. <laughs> because by 1780, uh, travel time was so much shorter. You see? Before that, if smallpox had to be, had to be communicated within 10 days, let's say somebody in Santa Fe was running away, which is the typical response, heading into the interior, or was trading and carrying smallpox with them, by the time they got to the next s s settlement, uh, either it, the smallpox was either dead or the people were dead because it took that long to walk, to walk. But suddenly on horses, you can carry the virus faster. So the very advantage of the horse, in this case, its speed and its ability to travel, turns on the Indians with catastrophic effects. Here's that old pre-Columbian contact pattern I showed you earlier in this talk. There's the, there's the pattern after contact. Now this map is, going back to this, that's this. It's this trade route used by the Shoshones and Comanches coming up out of the southwest into the northwest. That was the route taken by smallpox. Right through there. So suddenly, this, the very thing that has given them this new power, that power then proves to be a terrible vulnerability. This is from a Lib Fenn's, Elizabeth Fenn's uh, estimates of the uh, smallpox deaths uh, in, in the, during these years. Oops. Well, you get the point. <laughs> Very good point. I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> SARS? Uh, sure. <laughs> right. dwell, dwell on this, right? Yeah. In the 17, 1830s, it would hit again. It would wipe out entire tribes um, and bands. But it wasn't until this revolution in transportation occurred, you know, that it, that it could happen. So here we see, we know in the long run, this first revolution over here would crush this one over here. But it was already happening. At the very time that the revolution over here was unfolding, it was coming to its culmination, it was already having an effect here. The smallpox that was coming out of the east now because of the horse revolution, because of the other revolution, was able to make its way up into the West and to begin this process, to begin this process of conquest. And on that chipper note, I will say uh, thank you uh, for uh, coming, and I, uh, I very much enjoyed it. I'm sorry I can't stick around. Go to hit to Scotland, and uh, but I uh, uh, give you my best. I, I, I appreciate the good work you're doing, and I hope you um, hope you keep it up. Thank you. <laughs>
Have you all heard how the uh, when you eat how the plates are right away? Right. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and I need to get directions if I can most directly to get back to the way to the airport. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Do you have do we have to get your jump drive? Can, can we get you your PowerPoint or not? I mean, if you don't want to sell, if you oh, don't no, share, that's you fine. I'd love to share it. I just, uh, can you do it Can you do it real fast? Yeah, like in a minute? Is that enough time? Yeah. Yeah. There are two of them. Uh, look under. No. I'll let you get your other stuff. Okay. Okay. That's all their heads. I like that one. Um, many of you have seen the slave shackles uh, that I teach with. The ones I've been forced to. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, yeah, long the years. That was fun. Like the new birth. Um, what? Oh, yeah.